Good morning. Uh, I'm Hal Humphreys. This is the monthly webinar from PI Education and Pursuit Magazine. We are absolutely tickled that you're here. And I am assuming that everything is working um, and broadcasting to the right place. I can't see it, so I'm sure I'll get a text if it's not. Um, we've been talking this month about niche um, markets, things that you can do to kind of set yourself apart from other investigators. I have focused the bulk of my um, investigative career on criminal defense work, which is a niche uh, part of the PI world. Um, I have also got a, an expertise in real estate valuation and um, fraud examination that I've kind of really honed into a very specific little niche market that uh, is when I get that work, it's lucrative and it's good and it's fun and it takes the skills that I have already and uses them in the PI field. Uh, today we have with us one of my favorite private investigators in the country. I've gotten to know him over the past couple of years with our PI happy hours here at PI Education Pursuit Magazine, Sam Petito. Um, when we talk about private investigators, we, we're really talking about a huge profession. Um, there, there are a ton of different specialties. Uh, so many, it's hard to even talk about this industry as one single field. Uh, we got surveillance folks who work family cases, divorces, and custody fights, uh, special investigations unit investigators looking for fraudulent insurance claims, people like Rochelle Davis who do adoption searches and reunite birth families, uh, fraud examiners like uh, Kelly Paxton who specializes even more by being an expert in pink collar crime. Um, forensic and crime scene reviewers like Dean Beers, corporate due diligence folks like Tyler Maroney, who interviewed, who we interviewed last year, OSINT experts like Brian Willingham, and criminal defense investigators like me. It's a huge business. So how do you set yourself apart? Um, our guest today, Sam Petito, he's a Pursuit contributor. Um, and if you check out Pursuit Magazine, there's an article by Sam in there about dog handling. And that's his specialty. Um, Sam is out of Durango, Colorado. He's carved out this little subspecialty that is so unique. I don't know anyone else who actually does it, but I'm going to let him tell you about this. Sam, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, tell us a little bit about how you, um, how you got to be the, the, the PI dog whisperer, for lack of a better word. I know you <laughs> really hate that. Well, you know, there, there, are, there are certainly other people who do it. I you know, like many things, I stumbled into it kind of by accident. I had the background, happened to meet someone who needed that skill set from a defense standpoint, and she got me started in a, a niche part of investigations that I didn't even realize at the time existed. You know, it's, it's interesting for expert witnesses, and that's what you are. You're an expert in that field, so you can, I mean, there are kind of two things that expert witnesses can do. Um, first is, just help the attorney understand the discipline. Um, be it for, for me, real estate appraisal is such a, such a bizarre little world that attorneys who've spent years going to law school and practicing law, they know the law inside and out, but they don't know anything about real estate valuation issues. Um, I'm assuming the same thing works for you. A lot of attorneys don't really know much at all about handling dogs on the fact that they probably have a dog. Uh, but they don't know anything about the, the, the ins and outs of actually handling a working dog. And one of the things that experts can do is provide kind of upfront counsel and education for attorneys to help them on cross-examination of, of another expert. Um, and that's all before and maybe even instead of you being put on the stand to talk about issues. Do you ever deal with kind of that kind of issue? Most of what I do is educating attorneys, not just ex explaining to them um, what is and is not true, because sometimes they have just as crazy ideas as members of the public might have about police dogs and how they work. Um, but um, I also, um, in addition to educating them, you know, I review the records. I've only been called to testify two times now. Neither time have I had to testify because it's it's been canceled at the last minute. But uh, the bulk of what I do is not just share information with attorneys about how, how drug dogs work, but also sometimes I help them with federal or state specific case law that they don't know exist. And, you know, I, I would think as a lawyer, they're the expert on the law, which they are, but I just happen to have some things in my back pocket that 
once in a while, it, it's really helpful to the attorney. They say, oh, I didn't know about that case. And that's exactly the type of, you know, the set of circumstances in this case. So that can be very helpful. Right. And if you've got that expertise, if you've got that training, you're going to know specific things that most attorneys aren't going to know because they don't focus on that one specific thing. And, and I'm assuming, you know, for, for real estate appraisal expert witness work, a lot of times the appraisal part of the lawsuit is a very tiny, minute part. So they can't spend a lot of time studying it. So they can hire an expert to come educate them. Um, for some of your cases, I would assume that the, the evidence that is gathered through the use of a drug dog, if that's kicked out, the case can go away. And that happens pretty often. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, you know, tell me a little bit about your background. Before you became a private investigator, you were in law enforcement, right? Yes, I was a cop here in Durango, Colorado. I did that for nine years. And the last five of those is when I had a, a dual purpose patrol and drug detection dog. Okay. And talk to me about the training that you went through as a law enforcement officer to learn how to handle dogs. Okay. I went to a school in North Carolina and spent 10 weeks there. When I showed up, uh, the dog was 90% trained. It was just, you know, the 10 weeks were to finish the dog and teach me how to operate him. Uh, but we spent a lot of time um, practicing, doing all the things that I would later do on live deployments, learning, learning not just how to correctly perform a sniff, but why it's important to do it this way in, in terms of how the dog learns or how the dog works. Um, we spent a lot of time learning about applicable case law because you know, there's a lot of laws that you have to learn to become a police officer. And there are a lot more laws that you have to learn that are canine specific, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, so it was a ton of education plus uh, learning with, uh, I think there were, there were three other handlers in my class when I started, one of whom was on his second dog. So he already had a lot of experience. So th those of us who were new, we got to learn a lot from him both about how to do it right. And he was pretty forthcoming about how to do it wrong so that we could avoid stepping on those landmines. Right. So it's a pretty extensive training process. And you worked with the dog for how many years did you work with the dog the last five years, five years of your, your tenure at the police department. So, I mean, that that's enough, the education and the training and experience that makes you an expert in that field. Right. Well, in, in terms of the, you know, the court definition, skill, knowledge, education, experience, and training. If you have one or more of those, then the average person makes you an expert. I, I certainly know that there are plenty of people in this industry, you know, who've worked two, three, even four dogs and have way more experience than I do. Um, and are much more skilled at things like, you know, I never, I didn't learn how to train my dog. He was already trained when they gave him to me. So I knew how to maintain that. And I, I had to do that week in and week out. But some schools that you go to, they hand you a brand new dog who knows nothing. And as a handler who knows nothing, they teach you how to teach the dog to become a drug dog or a patrol dog or a dual purpose dog. So my, my uh, experience is kind of limited even within the police canine world. Right. And I think that's one of the things that's really important um, when you're dealing with niche little areas in the PI world, um, you can be an expert, you can be the expert, but I think it's really important to be upfront and honest with your attorneys and the people that are mm -hmm. hiring you. Um, this is what I can do. This is what I cannot do. And I'm not qualified to talk about X, Y, and Z. Be upfront with them and tell them, I, I don't know about that. That's something I can't speak to. Um, I had to do that just yesterday with somebody who called me about a a search and rescue dog, they're working on a dead body case. And I said, I can tell you about dogs in general, but uh, I've seen uh, cadaver dogs, but never worked one, never handled one. I'm the wrong guy for this. Right, right. And, and that, that's, here's the thing for the, for the folks out there watching, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with an expert um, niche market for, for what it is you do, it can be really hard. I've seen so many experts get on the stand and answer questions that they shouldn't answer because they are either not qualified or don't have the information to answer the question. Um, and it's, it's really hard to say, I don't know, but everybody, and I mean, everybody, your client, the judge, the jury, if there is one, the opposing counsel, everybody is going to respect you more 
if you say, I just don't know about that. I can't speak to that. Um, it's outside of your expertise. Um, I got, I got a couple of questions coming in from the crowd. This is a good bunch of people in the room. Eric Shanholzer says, um, and this is the first question of the day. He said, uh, Hey Sam, I knew a canine off officer who spoke, um, in Klingon. The dog's name was Worf. Do you know any other canine officers who speak in other languages? I, I would say most of them in the United States do because the dogs come from Europe. That's where they get their initial obedience training. Sometimes that's where they also get their police training. So uh, it's not unusual to find dogs that are being spoken to in German or Dutch. Um, my, my dog was from Slovakia, but he, you know, he got trained in North Carolina. So I like to joke that he was the language he was trained in was y'all. Um, <laughs> Easy now. Easy now. Yeah. You're, you're getting kind of close to home. Right. I, I didn't mean to hit a nerve there, but you know that I, I remember my, you know, my trainer was uh, Tracy Bowling and he was born and raised North Carolina guy. And the first time he took us out to do buried hides, you know, put some, uh, some drugs in the ground and bury it and see if the dog can find it. He, he told me we we're going to do bird hides. And it was like a week before I understood that he wasn't saying B I R D. He was saying B U R I E D. But you know, eventually I adapted it. You know, that wasn't wasn't exactly like learning a different language. But yeah, it's it's pretty common for dogs to be trained in a foreign language of the country of their origin. Okay, um, and you know, I, I'm assuming a dog like a, a, a baby human doesn't really care what language it starts off with. That's what it's going to be comfortable with. Um, so if if you do start training a dog in say Klingon, which I think would be kind of funny, but um, whatever the commands are the commands. Right. And you could also, sw I mean, I could have taught my dog commands in Japanese if I felt like it, but English, but English was the language that they chose down there because in the Southeast, a lot of canine handlers get into shootings. Oh, wow. I, I think, you know, probably nationally because we, we go to the hot calls if you have a patrol dog, but what they found was handlers under stress would be start yelling at their dog in English forgetting the Dutch or the German and the dogs looking at them like, I don't know what you want me to do. So uh, they, they switched to training their dogs, at least at this school, they switched to training their dogs in English and started having less dogs get killed because they're standing, you know, out in the open during a gunfight instead of running back to the handler to, to get cover and be safe. Okay. What kind of um, drug dog work did you do with the uh, Durango police department? And how did you get into that department, that part of the department? <laughs> well, again, interestingly, um, by accident, you know, I was looking, I was interested in doing highway drug interdiction. And there were no dogs working in, in my part of the state at the time. So I went to the DEA's website. And in Colorado, I-70 is the main east-west artery across the state. It runs from Utah to Kansas. Right. And I-25 is the main north-south artery that runs from New Mexico through the state all the way up to Wyoming. I noticed that what, what the DEA calls high intensity drug trafficking areas, every single county along I-70 and every single county along I-25 were considered high intensity drug trafficking areas because there are a lot of officers doing interdiction there. The only other county in the state of Colorado that was a high intensity drug trafficking area was mine. And I'm down in the Southwest corner of the state. There's not much around, but I realized it's because Highway 160 is kind of the back way, east to west from Utah across to Kansas. So you stay off the interstate where the interdiction cops are. And Highway 550 is kind of a back north-south route um, from New Mexico up at least to, to the center of Colorado. So um, I started talking to the chief about, hey, why don't we get a drug dog? I had no interest in working the dog. I just wanted us to get one so we could start picking off big loads of drugs. Right. And in, in the end, when it came time to have somebody go to handler school, Nobody applied for the job but me. So that, that's how I ended up getting it. That's fantastic. I love yeah. that. Um, so we got a couple of questions coming in. Um, first one from Stephanie. Stephanie is our uh, director of operations here at PI Education. She keeps the house running. She's brilliant and, and crazy useful and helpful to private investigators trying to get their uh, education done. Um, but she says, how does, or is it even possible for a private investigator to qualify to get a drug dog for business? Well, after I left the police department, I worked my dog privately for two years, mostly doing drug detection in schools, but I was also available to private companies or you know, private individuals. You think your teenager is using Coke? I'll sniff their bedroom or sniff the garage and see what we find. 
Um, uh, mostly in schools is where we got the majority of our money. And there are plenty of private, they're not plenty, but there are private drug detection companies out there who use dogs. Okay. Um, somebody like Stephanie who wants to get into this, they would just have to get a dog, get trained and start marketing that business. Um, usually these dogs are only found in larger cities. Like I know Phoenix has one, maybe two, um, but they're not common, but they do exist. But I've also, I've talked to people as far away as California who sometimes get contracted to fly to Colorado to do private drug sniffs because there aren't many people around who are doing it. And sometimes there's no one in a particular state. Wow. Now, do you still have a dog that works? Uh, I, I don't, but I, I have my dog Uto with me here today. <laughs> says Uto. Um, uh, so no, he, he we we had to put him down last July third. He got cancer, oh, and uh, I just can't bring myself to to get another dog. Yeah, I understand that. I totally understand that. Um, Jordan Smith says, "Do you have an ADC contract as an expert?" Uh, and then he says, "I'd like to have your services in the back pocket on ADC cases." Do you know what he's talking about? I am on the ADC list as a canine expert. ADC is Alternate Defense Counsel, and in Colorado, that's where. Um, if you and I got arrested for committing a crime, Hal, and you had used the public defender's office before, they, would, they wouldn't take me as well. Because even if I need a public defender, they consider that a conflict. You're their client. They can't represent me too, because they all kind of work together on cases sometimes. So I would get farmed out to a private attorney in the community who contracts with the state through the Office of Alternate Defense Counsel. And okay. ADC has contract attorneys, contract investigators, and contract experts. I, I happen to be a, an investigator and an expert both for ADC. So yes, I'm available. Okay, great. So Jordan, um, I, I'm assuming we'll at some point share uh, some form of contact information here where you can get in touch with Sam. Super, thank you. Um, we, are, we are pushing up kind of right at what, what Kim Green, our editor-in-chief here at um, Pursuit Magazine, calls the mid-roll. Uh, which means it's time for me to tell you guys, if you need continuing education, check out PI Education. We, I think we have the best available. Um, we certainly have a lot of courses online. Um, we always offer our free monthly webinar once a month and enjoy doing that. But in the meantime, um, this weekend, 4th of July weekend, so the discount code is FREEDOM. FREEDOM, yeah, Sam's taking some PI Education classes there. 15% um, off of any course you want to take through July the 15th, and the discount code is FREEDOM. Um, and I do talk about PI education in glowing terms. I realize that I'm biased, but I do like the education offerings we have. We've got some absolute experts and fields out there that have helped us out with coursework, and um, I think it's good stuff. Sam, <coughs> so you work with the police department, you do that thing, you get into the drug dog uh, world. Um, how did you become a private investigator? I got burned out being a cop. I was, I was a patrol officer, but in my department, there weren't enough cops to handle the patrol work and have a dog handler only do dog stuff. So I had to cover you know, 40 to 50 hours a week as a patrol cop and do all the dog work that came up and keep my dog trained at least 16 or more hours a month. And I was on the SWAT team. And at one point I was putting on most of the trainings for the SWAT team, I, I just took on too much and I got burnt out. So that's why I decided to leave. And when I did, I didn't know what to do. I knew we wanted to stay here because, you know, this area, it's a four season resort area. We love living here. Um, and, you know, I, I've had some pretty good jobs in the past in other fields, but we didn't want to leave. And none of those other jobs were options here. So uh, almost halfway on a lark, I decided to become a private investigator. I already had some Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> figured why not give it a try um and uh you know I, I i knew a defense attorney actually from working dogs she had a search and rescue dog and i had met her before i even got my police dog but um i talked to her about getting me into doing criminal defense investigations and she gave me a try and that's that's how i made the transition okay very cool um i'm gonna see if i can open up this um let me see if i can share the screen real quick this is um share screen all right. Can you see that, Sam? Does that have the Pursuit Magazine? Um, yes. Okay. So this is Sam, one of Sam's stories in Pursuit Magazine, Drug Dog Evidence, a Primer for Legal Investigators. 
uh, check it out at pursuitmag.com. Um, it's a really interesting story. And there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about in specific, because, you know, this falls into the realm of those, um, those little bits of knowledge that experts have that other people don't. And an attorney that, that is not familiar with drug dog training and drug dog cases might not know that the dog team, meaning the handler and the dog, are required to have a certain number of hours training on a monthly basis. Talk to me about that. Well, the, the national standard is 16 hours a month or more. And that breaks down to about four hours a week, which if you work a, you know, four 10 hour days, which a lot of cops do, it's an hour a day. And that's what you need to keep your dog at a proficient level. Um, some states mandate that 16 hour standard. Some states it's voluntary. Other states say nothing about how much you have to train your dog. But nationally, if you asked a canine handler in Portland, Oregon, or Miami, Florida, or Maine or San Diego, wherever, how many hours a month you have to train your dog, they'll probably all tell you 16 hours a month because it's recognized nationally as the minimum. And if you are working on a drug case and you realize the dog hasn't been trained um, or they don't have documentation of the training, what, what are you looking for for documentation of the training of the dog? Well, it's pretty simple. I wanna see how many hours a month on average do they train the dog? Um, what kind of training are they doing? Is it, is, it, um, is it the kind of training where they're challenging the dog or is it just I'm putting things down here at nose level and making it easy and you know, so, so I can check that box that I did my training this month. Um, I also want to see how often is the dog wrong as opposed to being right. I'm interested in how often do handlers have their dog walk through an area where there are no drug odors to detect just to make sure that every single time they deploy the dog, the dog doesn't learn that this is the game. You say find drugs, I go sit someplace and I get my ball. No handler wants that. You want your dog to tell you it's there if it is and to tell you it's not if it's not. So practicing things like blanks, um, which is where there's no odor, no odor to detect, that's really important. Um, and then I also take a look to see if the team is certified because certification is another national standard and annual is the, um, that's normally how I see it. Some teams will certify every six months, but certification is nothing more than taking a test to see if your dog meets minimum basic standards. Can your dog find the odors? And can you interpret what your dog is telling you to correctly, to, to correctly say to a judge, my dog says yes, or my dog says no. That, that's what I look for in a nutshell when I go through training records. Interesting, interesting. Um... So we've got a, got a couple of questions coming in again uh, from the crowd. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, the, all right. So most of the time as a defense investigator, you're going to be looking at the, the prosecution's dog evidence. Correct. Okay. Um, is there any case where you would bring a dog into a defense case as a defense investigator or for the defense? What do you mean bring a dog in? Would you ever work a dog on a defense case? Is there, is there a scenario where that could happen? No, no. My, my job is simply consulting. And whether I'm working for the defense or even if the prosecution hired me, which, which they could, um, I just look at the records. If there's like, let's say there's video of the traffic stop where you got caught with 50 pounds of heroin. Sometimes attorneys will say to me, I've watched this video and I don't see the dog doing anything. I'd like you to take a look at it. And when I look at the video, sometimes it's pretty nuanced and I can say, well, look, do you see this or that? Right. That's the dog saying yes. Um, other times the dog's trying to go off in the grass or, you know, sniff anything but the car. And I tell the attorney, you're not wrong. You're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. This dog doesn't seem to be interested in the car at all. Um, okay. Okay. All right. So let's take a few minutes and just kind of walk through, um, what does reviewing drug dog evidence entail? Let's just kind of walk through the very basic process for reviewing drug dog evidence. Okay. The first thing I do is explain to the attorney what records they need to request from the prosecution and why they need to request those records. And then once they provide the training records for me, canine handlers are supposed to keep track of all the training that they do with their dog, specifically so that when they go to court, they don't just testify yeah, I train my dog at least 16 hours a month. 
they can show proof here every, every month for the last 12 months, I've trained my dog 20, 24, 30 hours each month. We practice drugs, we practice obedience, whatever different discipline the dog is trained in. After I get those records, I go through, um, sometimes they're electronic, but most of the time they're handwritten. So I have to, first of all, decipher what some of the chicken scratch actually means. And then I convert it all into a spreadsheet where it's not only easy for me to read, but it's easy for me to um, look at things, you know, like you can do with spreadsheets, look at things different ways. And I want to see, first of all, is there 16 hours a month of training? Is this training where the handler has, uh, you know, not just done 15 hours of obedience and one hour of drug detection each 16 hour block? Because you can, courts have never said, if you have a drug dog who also has obedience, you need 16 hours for drug practice and 16 hours for obedience. It's just 16 hours total. So handlers can, can do that how they want. But common sense tells you that, you know, if I practice push-ups 15 hours a month and sit-ups one hour a month, I'm probably going to be better at push-ups than I am at sit-ups. And it's the same thing with, with dog work. So I look and see what kind of training they're doing, how much training they're doing, are they certified? And then um, I also look for hints at veracity. You know, I have reviewed more than one set of records where I'm looking at a unicorn. It's a perfect dog. And in the last year or even three years, this dog has never made a mistake in training. I don't think the perfect dog exists. Right. So that's not necessarily the handler being sly or lying in their records. You know, if, if I send my dog out to find something that I've hidden for him and he doesn't find it, and I take him back and put his nose right on it to show him where it is, and my dog sits, there are handlers that will record that as the dog being right. Okay. I personally would not do that. So I, I like seeing, and I think courts expect to see dogs that make mistakes. It's okay. You know, yeah. whether they miss something that's hidden or whether they say it's hidden when there is nothing hidden there, that doesn't matter. But um, I look for red flags like that. Like, does this appear to be the perfect dog? Um, some handlers don't record the number of hours that they train. They'll just say, I, re I worked 20 hours last month and 18 hours the month before that, but there's no documentation of that whatsoever in their records. Uh, is that a deal breaker? Can be, but whether or not that that's going to be a deal breaker is up to the attorney that I'm working for and the attorneys on the other side and the judge. Um, right. All I do is I provide the information to whoever it is that hired me, explain to them why this means whatever I'm saying it means. And then I also, a lot of times I'll give the attorney who's retained me what the counter arguments might be from the other side yeah. and some of the things they can use to defeat those counter arguments. Or I'll just tell them, you need to stay away from this particular point because their counter argument is valid and there's no way you can spin this in your client's favor. So shy away from these few points here and focus on these points over here. Right. And I think that's that's one of those things where an actual expert in the field can say to the attorney who's working for, they're going to come back with this, this and this. And here's how you need to respond to this, this and this. And that's very useful for the attorneys, because a lot of times, again, attorneys are really good at the law, but they're probably not experts in dog handling or medical examination or real estate. Or, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. if you tell them, hey, here's where they're going to come back with this, this, and this, it's a very helpful thing to do. Um, <clears throat> this, I, I'm, I'm just tickled with this conversation. I think it's really fascinating. Great. Um, so let's see here. Um, all right, great question. Jason Osignac uh, out of um, Illinois, friend of the group. He's been in several of the happy hours with us. Jacob says, um, what breed or breeds of dog are most used for drug detection work? In the United States, I would say police departments, if they're going to have a dog that sniffs drugs and also finds and bites people, um, which is, that's dual purpose. That's what a lot of departments do so they can get more bang for their buck, essentially. It's German Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds, and Belgian Malinois. Okay. Those, are, those are the three main breeds that are used for dual purpose dogs. They're also the three breeds that are used if it's just going to be a straight patrol dog where we search buildings, we search fields, and we'll bite people if the handler tells us to. But just in terms of uh, a single purpose drug dog, for a single purpose drug dog, there is no breed that's the best. 
What makes a dog really good at detecting drugs or bombs if it's a single purpose dog is not the breed, it's how much natural instinctive drive does that dog have for a specific reward, like a ball or a tug. Mm -hmm. My dog, for instance, if I put my dogs, if I didn't feed my dog for 24 hours and then put a bowl of food down next to his toy, he would go for the toy 10 times out of 10 because he was just crazy for this ball. Yes, he wanted to eat, but give him a choice. And I, and I did this. He always take the ball. Um, dogs with really high drive like that, whether it's a, a tiny little, you know, a, a little terrier or whatever, the, um, uh, you know, customs, they use a pretty wide variety of dogs or have in the past. And like in airports, you'll see smaller dogs. Number one, they're less intimidating. Number two, it's much easier for me as a handler with a 15 pound dog to pick it up and put it on top of a pallet of stuff at an airport or a warehouse to sniff around up there than it is for me to pick up my 75 pound German shepherd on my shoulder and try and throw him up there. So, you know, they, they're easier to put in smaller places. They don't eat nearly as much. Um, there's less poop to clean up. There's, there's all kinds of benefits to using smaller dogs, but the breed really doesn't matter if it's going to be a single purpose drug dog. The drive that's innate in the dog is all that matters. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. And now, you know, nine times out of 10, when you see a police canine unit and probably 99 times out of a hundred is going to be some version of the, the, the German shepherd or what were the other two you said? A Belgian Malinois or a Dutch shepherd. Yeah. Um, let's see, maybe you already covered this, but where do you find a single purpose drug dog and a trainer? You could find a really good single purpose drug dog at a pound. You know, if, if you find a dog there that's just crazy for a ball or a piece of rope or whatever, I mean, some agencies will get their dogs from the pound. It doesn't, you don't have to pay $5,000 for a, a dog that came from a police breeder to have a dog that's going to be a good drug dog. I mean, a lot of people watching. Go ahead. Then you take it to the trainer that is known for teaching the dog what to look for. Right, right. And, you know, t teaching a dog to find drugs is like teaching a dog to do anything else. You make it a game, you make it fun, you do it in short intervals, and you always end on a positive note. That's how you teach your dog to sit or shake at home. And it's the same way that they teach dogs to find drug odor or explosive odor at police training facilities. It, it's the same methodology that's used. Okay. Um, let's see, moving on. Um, all right, we've covered that. It seems like you, all right, so this is, this is Kim Green writing and I don't disagree with it. It seems like you're basically the expert on this. How do you become the go-to guy for this? Are you taking cases from all over Colorado, outside of Colorado? How does that work? Okay, um, I, I'm certainly not the guy. Uh, I'm aware of at least 10 or 12 other people nationally who, who do what I do. Um, a lot of former canine handlers won't do defense work. Um, and some of them will do defense work, but they won't do federal defense work. There's too many hoops to jump through, or they just don't want to work against cops. Um, so I don't feel like the expert at all, but um, can you ask me the questions again? I forget what they were. Yeah, so it's, uh, do, you, do you work all over Colorado? Do you travel outside of Colorado? Okay, sure. Um, so I started with a local case here in the adjoining county to me through an attorney that I was already working for. And then my name kind of spread. I had a couple other calls for private cases from my corner of the state. And then I got on the ADC list where I started being available to attorneys statewide. And then one of the attorneys from you know four or five hours away in Colorado who used me on one of her cases, she knew a federal public defender on the West Coast. And I got a job over there. And that person knew a federal public defender on the East Coast. And I got a call from New York. And you know, right now, um, I'm looking at my board. I've got two cases in Colorado, three cases in California right now. So right now, at least the majority of my cases are outside the state, but it, it's all been word of mouth. And I finally did some marketing and, and asked the last attorney that called me, how did you hear about me? Because I don't advertise. Um, and, and he said, we got a list. We call people on the list. We see who's available. We see who's interested and um, you know, look at their backgrounds and, and go from there. But it's a, it's a pretty short list, but there are, there are certainly quite a few other people doing it. And um, several, if not most, have been doing it longer than I have. But we all, you know, we all come from the same kind of background. We used to be a handler, and now we'll tell anybody that asks 
what's the right way to be a handler and what's the wrong way to be a handler. Yeah. Um, so before I get to my next real question, um, this is not an unreal question. Um, Stephanie says, what is your favorite breed, Sam? Like your all time favorite breed. I have to say German Shepherd with the caveat that I lucked out and had a great dog, which is why I'm really hesitant to get another one because I don't want to always compare the next dog to my past dog. Um, but, you know, I like the German Shepherd, but it's all that I know. Right. You know I, I had a dog as a kid. It's not like I've had 20 different dogs as a pet owner or four different dogs as a police canine handler. I'm partial to Shepherds because they're really smart they're really loyal. They're really obedient. And they're, they're just fun. You know, my, my dog was kind of like me. He, he could be all business when it was time for that, but he could also be a goofball when we were at home and it was time to relax. You know, I, I can't remember how many times I'd see him chasing his tail around in a circle. And I'm like, are you kidding? You're like, you're the super sharp, hot shit patrol dog, drug dog. And we get home and you're trying to catch your tail. It's not going anywhere and you're never going to catch it. But, you know, that, that's part of why I liked him specifically. Um, but it also endeared me to the, the German Shepherd breed in general. People that take on the role of um, dog handler for the police, are those dogs with them all the time? Yes. Uh, and the agency almost always, and for liability purposes, always should um, own the dog. But the handler, at the end of the day, I would bring my home dog with me. And he had his place here at our house. Um, and, you know, I wasn't allowed to do private drug detection work with him while I was still with the police department. But if I wanted to take him camping with me or take him on vacation with me, he was my dog. So I was able to do that. Different agencies have different policies on what you can or can't do with your dog off duty. But in general, the handler always acts like the dog is theirs, even though the city or county that they work for will be the true owner of the dog. And I'm curious, so when you left the police force, did, did the county deed the dog over to you or how, did, how does that work? We did a written contract and I paid the city of Durango $1 as a token amount to show a formal transfer of liability. And after my last day as a cop, if my dog bit anybody or did anything he shouldn't have done, that was on Sam versus before that it was gonna be on the city. But yeah, so the, the dollar is just a token amount and that's pretty standard across the country. Okay, that, that's interesting. I'm, 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 uh, that's fascinating. One of the things I want to point out, so we're talking about niche markets for private investigators. And a lot of times if you are an expert or you have a little niche thing that it is you do, um, you're going to end up doing expert work in some form or fashion. Um, and Sam has said a couple things throughout this conversation that I think are really key. Number one, if you're an expert witness, your job is to help the trier of fact understand properly best methods, um, best practices, you know, training, certification records, calibration, those kind of things. Um, if you're an expert witness and you're testifying or you're helping an attorney, part of your job should always be to deliver to that attorney good facts and bad facts. Don't hide the bad things from them. Point them out. Let them know if, if, opposing, if the opposing side has done just a stellar job and their dog is perfectly trained and their handler is like top in the country and can show with a log book everything they've done for the past 16 months training wise, your job as an expert is to tell the lawyer they've done a really good job here. And this is one that you're not going to you're not going to make much headway with. Am I right about that, Sam? Yes, and I've had to do that a couple times where I tell the attorney, you have to find something else to attack because the dog work is solid. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, Sam, you mentioned that there are a lot of dog handlers that are retired from law enforcement that will not work for the defense. I have had countless, I mean, countless conversations with um, law enforcement and ex-law enforcement about the topic of working for the dark side of the defense. And the argument that seems to make the most sense is if someone is out there doing subpar work, do you want someone to go to jail on that? And that's where I think people kind of get their head around it. If, if somebody's out there with, with a, a beautiful German shepherd that's just eating, you know, snacks out of everybody's hands and getting petted at home like a puppy and, and not doing the training, 
then and literally the guy tells the dog find drugs or whatever he says and the dog always finds drugs i mean you want to point that out you don't want someone going to jail on that right and i've never been asked to testify against a handler who did everything right yeah this doesn't happen yeah yeah okay um did you ever expect to be doing this kind of work no no th this is this is one of the last things i ever expected to do because you know as a cop Looking back now, I feel like I got lied to because as a cop, you are told defense attorneys are shady people that will do anything they can to get their guilty clients off. And this lady who got me into defense work, who I knew from the, the dog world, when I told her that, she cracked up. She's laughing and she said, hold on, you guys think that I'm going to risk my license to practice law to keep a meth dealer from going to prison for selling meth, that's what cops believe. And I said, 100% of us, 100% of the time, yes. And she couldn't stop laughing. She's like, you guys are idiots. No, my job as a defense attorney is just to make sure that the cops and the prosecutor did their job. And when she said that, it, it made sense to me. And what I've found in doing these, these consultations for people, whether it's true criminal defense or specifically canine related, I don't do anything as a criminal defense investigator or canine expert, that's different from what I would do as a patrol supervisor if I had unlimited time to review all of my officers' reports and videos and stuff and you know, catch the gaps that exist there. Say, uh, you, you, know, you forgot to put the elements of the crime in this affidavit, go back and fix it. Or what you wrote in your report doesn't match what I'm seeing in the video you better fix this before we send it across the street to the prosecutor's office. If, if patrol supervisors had the time to do that, people like you and I wouldn't have a job in criminal defense. There, there wouldn't be a need for us because right. there would never be anything to find. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, it's crazy important. All right. On the dog subject, uh, we've got a question from Bisk Chan one. Are there any programs available to assess a dog's ability to train? I'm not sure I understand the question. Then you go to a pound, you find a dog that's motivated by a toy or whatever, and you think this is going to be great, but then it seems like he's, he's untrainable. Or I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm making some assumptions here, but is there, is, can someone assess pretty quickly whether or not a dog is going to be able to learn? Somebody with a lot of experience working dogs or training dogs can do it quickly. If, if I, as a private citizen, said, I love the idea of starting a private drug detection company. I want to go find a dog and do that. If I was going to go to the pound and look for a dog, first, I would find a local canine handler with a lot of experience working drug dogs and say, would you go to the pound with me and test some of these dogs? And we might do that. And the handler says, none of these dogs are what you want. So then I might have to go to one of the vendors that sells dogs to police departments and get them to sell me a dog that would be good for drug detection work. And I could even go to that school and have them train me, you know, if the school is willing to do it. Um, but the, there's, there's no magic formula that I could tell you in 30 seconds here as a person with no prior training or handling experience that will help you pick out a dog that would be good for this. You, you gotta, you gotta find somebody who can do that for you. Right. Right. You gotta find an expert for that. Exactly. Yep. All right. So um, wrapping it up, we're, we're about 45 minutes in here and um, uh, you know, we've, we've been trying, we've been trying to make these things as concise as possible. So I'm going to go on down to the last question here, which is Sam, do you have any advice for fellow investigators who are looking for a niche um, who want to carve out a special place for themselves in this industry? And this is not just for people that want to do dog work. How do, how do you find your niche? If, if you're out there doing PI work, how do you find that niche thing that, that you can, dig into? Well, I kind of stumbled into mine, but to do it over, I would look at um, what am I good at doing? What do I enjoy doing? What do I make the most money doing? Yeah. I, I would consider all of those and then find one to focus on. I also, I don't like to admit to being a nerd, but I read a lot. Um, anything that I can get my hands on related to dog training, police dog training specifically, um, defense or prosecution of dog cases. I read deposition transcripts that I'm able to find online. I read articles written by people who still train police dogs or people who put on trainings for criminal defense attorneys. Um, and then just in general, I, I, like I got a stack of books here, practical investigations for legal invest or um, yeah. 
practical methods for legal investigations. I have a book, the A to Z Guide to Expert Witnessing, which is published by a company in Florida called Seek, where their niche is they teach people how to be experts yeah. or teach them how to become better experts. And then uh, I also, I find books written by cops for cops, like canines in the courtroom. The four guys who wrote this book, they, they go through step-by-step step in here. If you're a police canine handler, here are all the things you need to do to never lose a case in court. And if you're a police canine handler out there and you haven't read this book by Brad Smith, Jeff Barrett, Andy Wyman, and Ted Douse, pick it up and read it because then you won't have to meet somebody like me. Your, your cases will always be winnable or, or, you know, if the case isn't winnable, it's not going to be because of the dog work. And I, you know, I was, I was pretty fortunate. Um, you know, I was just as anal as a cop as I am now about trying to learn everything I can. I didn't have a single one of my dog cases get tossed and I didn't even have to go to court and testify one time in five years because yeah. I did what everybody what, what, what all the authorities and experts told me to do. Train 16 hours or more a month. I would do it. Get certified once a year, twice a year. I would do it. Work, you know, Pay out of your own pocket to go to trainings if your department won't pay for you to do it. I did that. I took a lot of vacations at my own expense to gain the knowledge that my agency wasn't able to or wasn't willing to provide for me, but I still thought it was important. So um, finding a niche... I guess can happen on purpose, but in my case, it just kind of happened by accident. And th the more I've done it, the better I've gotten. And the reason that I keep doing it is because it's kind of like what you said before. Yes, I'm hired by one side or the other, but if the defense hires me or the prosecution hires me for case X, the information that I'm going to give either side will be exactly the same. The facts are the facts. The supporting case law for or against, it's the case law. Um, the nuances of what happens in training or in a video, it, it is what it is. So I, I explain all that stuff to whoever it is that hires me, and then I let them do with it what they will. But that's, that's my best advice is um, you may stumble into it, or if you want to focus on something, that's great, but figure something out that you can make a living doing. Otherwise, it's not really worth doing. Yeah, it has to be, you have to do something that you can get paid for. I mean, this purple leather that we like to wear doesn't pay for itself. Um, you know, the, the Hawaiian shirts don't pay for themselves. Um, so find something that, that will pay. But, you know, if you're looking for an expertise or a niche thing that you do, I mean, start with something you just like doing, something that you enjoy that people don't understand. Um, you know, a lot of people find dogs to be mystifying as far as how do they, how do they know this drugs are, you know, if you hide it in coffee, he can't sense it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you, if you have an area where you find yourself explaining it to people all the time, um, and Eric, to answer your question, there's nothing at all wrong with nerds. I'm a proud nerd. <laughs> uh, so if, if you if you're a nerd and you like to explain, you know, the thing, you know, a lot about to people and you're good at it, then you're probably going to be good at an expert witness in that in that area. Um, the other thing I would say, Sam just held up a book A to Z and expert witnessing. I mean, like that. Why not look through that book and say, oh, well, that looks interesting. Mm -hmm. um, hold that book up again, if you don't mind. There it sure. Is. A to Z guide to. Oh, I'm sorry. Witnessing. Yeah, there you go. Um, and it's you know, the, the company that. Oh, sorry. The company that makes it, I gotta kill my light. Yeah. Seek, S E A K. That's a company in Florida, and their website is probably seek.com or something similar. But they do a lot of training for how to set up an expert witness practice, how to write bulletproof expert witness reports, how to do well during cross examination, all, all kinds of stuff specifically for expert witnesses, new or veteran. Yeah, that's great. That's a great resource. Um, okay, so. Next really important question before we get, get finished up here, Sam, there are some flags on the wall behind you. And I think Kim Green pointed out, they look like nautical flags. Tell us about those flags. They are, th those are naval pennants. Uh, and the top one, it's hard pointing backwards. The top one is the P, Papa, and the bottom was the A, Alpha. So, um, you know, there's a pennant for every letter in the alphabet. These two together, P, A, are the, you know, the initials for Petit Don Associates, which is my company. Um, and then they're also, they're flown this way at sea, usually only over minesweepers. And what they mean is 
I will indicate the swept channel. You should follow in my wake. And I thought that was analogous to what I do as a, a criminal defense investigator in general and a, a canine consultant specifically. I show people how to get from where they are to the end of the line as safely as possible, just like minesweepers do for other ships at sea. Um, so it just, just happened to work out that it was also the initials for my company. I love it. I thank love you. it. I love it. Sam, thank you so much for being here. Um, for those of you in the crowd, if you want to learn more about dogs, um, Pursuit Magazine, reviewing drug dog evidence, a primer for legal investigators is a great place to start. Sam has always been very helpful in answering questions for me, I'm sure. Uh, if you have questions for Sam, he would be more than happy to answer them for you. Um, and Sam, is there an email address or some, some form of communication that you're comfortable sharing? And if you're not, that's totally okay. Sure. Um, I'll give my phone number. It's 970-317-9796. Or you could email Durango Private Investigator at gmail.com. Perfect. Perfect. Sam, thank you again for being here. It's good to see your face. It's been too long. Um, and we'll do a we'll do a PI happy hour before too terribly long so we can spend some more time together. Thanks for having me. I hope people learned a little bit today. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Okay.